one and only Nancy Cohen. Nancy! Glory, all honor. This is such a pleasure for us because Nancy is like love on legs. <laughs> and Nancy has been so good in, in actually demonstrating that love and that mama love for the nations. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I felt that. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. You know, like, uh, you know, for years people were crying out for the fathers of the mystical movement to arise, and everybody wanted the fathers, but we had a mama. We also, we also the whole time. Yeah, we, we need a mama too, you we know? Need a mama. And, and Nancy really reflects that, doesn't she? Yeah. We love you, you so we love you very much. <laughs> we bless you. You're already <laughs> blessed, blessed to the max, but we bless you anyway. You're overflowing, my darling. We're you ready for what you got. You are us. overflowing. Yeah. So everyone, Please. raise your hands towards Nancy. Yeah. The more uh, blasted she is, yeah, the better <laughs> she speaks. <laughs> <laughs> you might even get the one note. <laughs> Well, that was one. Oh. Hip, hip. Oh. And one more. Hip, hip. Oh. I love you guys. All right. Whoa, whoa. Oh. Hey, the girls got her own no, mic. Don't touch me. Oh. <laughs> That's what I have to say. Don't touch me. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, my gosh. Okay, everybody just had a good lunch, so I want everybody to stand up. We're going to get in our very, very authoritative stance right now. The word says in Ephesians chapter 1, for this purpose, the manifold, manifold, manifolded wisdom of God is made known to us, that we put on notice the rulers and principalities, what is the mystery of God that has been hidden it has been hidden. It has been hidden. <laughs> the thing is, the mystery of God that has been hidden is about ready to be revealed. And it is sitting in your chair, okay? So I want everybody to get in a very authoritative, authoritative stance. You got, you got power. You have power inside of you. So we're going to make a declaration. Whoa! Whoa! And we're going to rehearse what Jesus said. I'm only quoting scripture. So anybody who leaves her saying I'm blaspheming, it's okay. He was called the same thing. I want everybody to point up into the heavens, and we're going to shout this three times to the heavens. We're going to put on notice those rulers and principalities. What is the mystery of God that has been hidden us? Okay. Behold! 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 The sons of God! Behold! 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 The sons of God! Behold! Behold! The sons of God! In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Don't sit down. We're not done. Everybody stand up. We're going to shout something to the heavens, and I want this. This is going to be a living reality. Yeah. It is already a living reality. It has always been a living reality, but now we're tapping into the eternal now. Okay? So I want everybody to put your hands up. If Jesus can do it, I can do it. Oh, that's pitiful. If Jesus can do it, I can do it. If he can do it, we can do it. If he can do it, we can do it. If he can do it, we can do it. In Jesus' name. Everybody give the Lord a big clap. Woo-hoo-hoo. 
Well, now you can sit down, if you can. <laughs> I, always, I always so love to start off any of these meetings with declarations. Because when we say something, the thing we say becomes so. Whoa! Whoa! We actually form our own reality. The words that come out of our mouth. Ooh, hoo, hoo. Okay. I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to start Hey 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 So the real reality is everybody's looking for signs and wonders. I tell you, you are the sign and the wonder. You are it is sitting in your seat. You are the signs. You are the wonders. We are in him. And everything he has we are. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm going to start with the scripture. Everybody get ready for a second day here. Okay. So, Shannon, we got it. Uh, go ahead and put it up. Uh, <laughs> whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Let's just see what the Spirit of the Lord has for us today. This is Psalms 8, verse 9. Lord, your name is so great. Your name is so great. You are so powerful. People everywhere see your majesty. What glory streams from the heavens, filling the earth with the fame of your name. <laughs> okay. Where do you see the whole earth filled with his glory? Oh, Lord, your name is so great and powerful. People everywhere see your splendor. Your glorious majesty streams from the heavens, filling the earth with the fame of your name. You have built a stronghold. Whoa. A stronghold by the songs of babies. Strength rises up with the chorus of singing children. This kind of praise has the power to shut Satan's mouth. Childlike worship will silence the madness of those who oppose you. Look at the splendor. Look at the splendor of all your skies. Your creative genius glowing in the heavens. When I gaze at your moon and your stars, mounted like jewels in their settings. Whoa! I know you are the fascinating artist who has fashioned it all. But when I look up, and I see such wonder, wonder in workmanship above. I have to ask this question. <laughs> Compared to all this cosmic glory, why would you bother with puny mortal men or be infatuated with Adam's sons? I love this word infatuated because really literally translated it means foolishly extravagant love. The first time I ever taught on this, somebody said, well, God never does anything foolish. And I said, well, he gave us independent will, didn't he? <laughs> foolish, extravagant love. Compared to all this cosmic glory, why should you bother? <laughs> Psalms 8, 5. Yet, yet, everybody say yet. Yet. What honor you have given to men, created only a little lower than Elohim, crowned like kings and queens with glory and magnificence. Do you know you're crowned like kings and queens? I have a queen over there who squeezed me so much today, royalty just oozed right out of her. Waha! You have delegated to them mastery over all you have made making everything subservient to their authority and placing the earth itself under the feet of your image bearers, Robo Shandai. I want you to notice this is written in present tense. <laughs> it's written in present tense. You have delegated to them mastery over all you've made, making everything subservient to their authority and placing the earth itself under the feet of your image bearers. <laughs> Listen, all the created order, every living thing of this earth, this earth, the sky, the sea, the wild beasts, all the sea creatures, whoa, everything is in submission 
to Adam's sons. I want you to notice he doesn't say everything will be. Everything will be. Everything shall be. <laughs> everything is in submission to Adam's sons. Lord, your name is so great, so powerful. People everywhere. How many of you know people everywhere? See your majesty. <laughs> what glory streams from the heavens, filling the earth with the fame of your name. Let's move over to the next one, Shannon. Wow. So today, based on that scripture being a present fact, which, by the way, it is a present fact, I want to talk to you today about living the limitless life. Do you know that God has already begun, and it's a transition, and it is happening. He's begun to restore the dew of our youth. Those of you who are over 50, I can tell you this is a thus saith the Lord. You're going to begin to feel younger and younger and younger. Your knees, your muscles, your, ner your nerves, your joints are going to get stronger. You're going to get a new pop in your step, a new jump in your dance. Whoa! <laughs> Restoration of the dew of your youth is already happening. I'm 75 years old. I have 24 grandchildren and 13 great-grandchildren, and I guarantee you I have so much energy, my grandkids can't keep up with me. <laughs> I'm flying all over the world, bungee jumping, skydiving, hang gliding, parasailing, deep sea diving, woohoo! Yeah. But restoration of the dew of your youth is only a part. Come on. It's a threefold unfolding. It begins with the restoration of the dew of your youth. Then it moves into longevity. And from longevity, it moves into immortality. And I am telling you right now, there is a generation that is going to step out, step up, step into their divine positioning, and they're going to live forever. I, I just love listening to Liz right? Doesn't she just ooze? She just oozes love and light. And I'm up here listening to her talk, and I thought, God, I sure would love to preach like that. I mean, it just pours out of her. It's like in every, she has 30 trillion cells. And every one of those 30 trillion cells is bursting with light, bursting and overflowing, ooh, with love. She is a forerunner of everything God's doing in the earth at this present time. Amen. So we're living in the limitless. <laughs> when I first met Justin, whoa, that was the life shifter. <laughs> Anybody in here know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I just looked at him and I thought, there is the real thing. Because we got a lot of non-real things motivating, <laughs> moving all over the earth. But you're it, man. You're the, you're the highest, <laughs> highest level. I, I honestly am telling you the truth. I've met a whole lot of mystics, but I consider him to be the highest ranking one. Not, not that we're any better than one another, but you see the true test of people that operate in the highest level of mystical is that they flow in love. There's a whole lot of mystical people out there tapping into galaxies, doing things in the stars, but they don't exhibit the love that that man does. Can I tell you just a mystical story before I start the thing on Limitless? So when I first, I think it was the first conference we ever did together, and Justin was there, and he just made this statement. He said, you know, one day I'm going to go to Mars, and I'm going to get a rubber ducky on Mars. <laughs> well, I heard that, and the Lord heard it. So I went home that night, and I said, Lord, I know how much you love Justin. And I know you want to show your love for Justin. So how about I come to Mars and I get him a rubber ducky? So that night, I went into heaven and I'm just standing there worshiping the Lord. And all of a sudden, my hand goes like this and I open my eyes. And there's a rubber ducky covered with red dust. That's how much he loves Justin Abraham. A lot of people, a lot, a lot of people would say... Well, you went to Walmart and bought that rubber duck. And I said, really? 
I preached in the, in the foyer of this hotel until 6.30 in the morning, and I was back in the pulpit at 8 o'clock in the morning. In between there, I took a shower, dried my hair, got dressed, and put together a whole PowerPoint. Exactly when do you think I had time to go to Walmart? <laughs> anyway, so today we're going to talk about living in the limitless. What the Lord is doing is he's taking us out of the limitations of our human existence and he's releasing us from the earthbound limitations of our human flesh and bringing us into the fullness of the limitlessness of our divine nature. You know, one of the mysteries is that God, who is so big, so huge, so magnificent, so powerful, would just fold himself up and put himself in us. And the awesome thing about the age we're living in is that God who folded himself up so small is about to unfold. What that means is everything that he is, everything that he was, everything that he's ever going to be, whoa, whoa, it all lives right inside of here. So what are we becoming? We're becoming the thing we've always been. When I talk about the eternal now, this is not root new revelation. People will come and say, beware of anyone who has new revelation because everything that can ever be written was already written in the scripture. I'm here to declare this is not new revelation. Actually, it's very ancient revelation. We're just now retapping into it. In fact, I, (laughs) I love all of Justin's teachings about the previous mystics of God. Because you see, this is not the first time. This has been activated in the world many times before. And there has always been a 10% order of Melchizedek. But the age that has now opened up for us is going to produce the most massive, most amazing, most glorious, most powerful stuff inside of us. Because you see, you're all full of rivers, geysers, fountains, whoa, waterfalls of river, rivers of living water inside of you. And what the Lord is doing through the sound, he's going deep, 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 calling unto deep. Whoa! (laughs) He's beginning to do this, and he's beginning to reconstruct all of our neural pathways because we've been we've been taught to believe that we're just poor miserable sinners here. We're always going to sin. We're always going to fall short of the glory of God. But that's not what he said. What he said is, go and be ye therefore perfect, and not just perfect, perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. I don't know about you all, but I think that's pretty darn perfect. So he's beginning to release us from the limitations, from the barriers, from the mindsets that we labored under for so long. He's beginning to release us now into the limitlessness. By the way, there's a book back there called Limitless. Some crazy woman wrote that book. So if you want to hear more about limitless living, check that out. So he's giving us what's called divine breakthrough. And divine breakthrough is not just a concept, it's actually a creature. But let's just talk about the meaning for divine breakthrough. Divine means of God, consisting of divine nature, Breakthrough whoa, means the destruction of all barriers and all limitations that prevent the final kingdom thrust, both in the natural and in the spiritual realms. And the occupation, everybody say occupation, occupation. of the spiritual territory that produces the manifestation of Christ's words, for with God, nothing is impossible. Everybody, I want to say this three times. With God, God, nothing nothing is impossible. impossible. With God, God, nothing nothing is impossible. impossible. With God, God, nothing nothing 
It's impossible. Ha, ha, ha. Do we really believe that? Okay, let me ask you. When the word says, if you have as much faith as a grain of mustard seed, just a little teeny tiny itty bitty, small as a little piece of pepper, if you have that much faith, you can speak to these mountains and say, be thou removed, and it shall be done, and nothing shall be impossible you. Mm. How many of us have moved a mountain from here to there? Just questioning. Oh, thank you, Wes. Oh, Shannon, did I leave that second page? No, I, ha- I had two pages back there. We're, we're, we're trying to run PowerPoint from back there instead of up here. So, ah, oh. okay, I'm going to skip through. What's the next one, Shannon? So what we want to talk about is we want to talk about how to function without limitations. Because the truth of the matter is we're moving into a position where we can actually change, shift, rearrange living matter. Everybody say matter. Matter. This really matters. It's important for us to understand not only are we going to move and change and rearrange the structure of matter, we're going to actually create matter. Okay? This is already happening today. I'm going to give you a few testimonies. So in the age of the church, and I want to be really careful here, we've left the age of the church, and we've moved into the age of the kingdom. That doesn't mean the age of the church, uh, that, that the church is over. What it does mean is that we're being elevated in very, very high levels of functionability. That we're not going to preach the same. We're not going to pray the same. We're not going to prophesy the same. We're not going to do altar ministries the same. We're not going to heal the same. We're not going to evangelize the same. Because what the Lord is doing now is increasing our level of authority. Whoa! Thank you, darling. Our level of authority to the point where all of those things are going to begin to lessen. They'll still remain active because there are people that are totally comfortable to stay there. And they'll stay there until the whole work is done. But what the Lord is doing now is he's searching throughout the earth for that 10% group of people who have such a depth of desire, who have such a depth of intentionality, who are determined with everything in their body, soul, and spirit that they're going to be united with his divine nature. So the carnal church has been teaching us for too long, well, God can do this, but he can't really do that. (laughs) In other words, he can let us die and take us away to a beautiful place in heaven. Ooh, ha, ha, ha. But he can't perfect and empower us to overcome death and have a perfect, unlimited church right here in this life. Robo. Robo. Woo-hoo. Basically, here's what our church doctrine has said. We believe in an all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful God. So big, so huge, so magnificent. He's just going to give away 90% of what he made to the devil. I don't think so. So there has to be a way of explaining what it is that we've been through. So, Shannon, let's go to 10. We're coming to the time now of release of limitations. And that means we have to, in our mindsets, also release him from the limitations in the box that we have put him in, saying he can only do this. I don't know how to tell you this. God is doing stuff in the earth that is so big, so huge, so magnificent, and he's doing it whether we like it or not. Whether it agrees with our theology or not, there is no limitation on God. Whoa, whoa. And there's therefore no limitation on us. This is what we're becoming. The Lord is shifting us now out of, out of the limitation of our human earth, earth-bound existence. And he's releasing us into the limitlessness. And that is going to include transfiguration. Now, I've been... I've been teaching transfiguration for about 40 years, and I've been called every name in the book, 
Everybody says that's not ever going to happen. And I said, oh, yes, it is. And I'm here to tell you it is happening now, okay? There are so many hundreds of testimonies in the earth. Whoa! So when Isaiah 60 says, arise, shine, for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you, though darkness covers the earth, gross darkness, the hearts of all men, yet my glory shall be seen upon you. And the kings of the earth and the unbelievers will be gathered together and converted unto me. Why? Because you preach a good message? I don't think so. Because you heal the sick and raise the dead? Not even. The reason is because there is coming the fulfillment of the pattern of him in our life. If we're going to un into perfect union with him, we're going to go in every step that he took. Amen? Including transfiguration. If you haven't heard about the seventh-day transfiguration of the corporate son of man, go back there and order it. There's a QR code some back, somewhere back there. And on that QR code are many deep teachings. I don't really put a whole lot on the Internet. And the reason why I don't is it calls me a world of hurt. You know what I'm talking about? So the issue is, for those that are interested, we have back on that table a QR code, and on there are lots and lots and lots of really, really meaty teachings. And when I say meat, I'm talking about steak, not, not milk, okay? So we're into the dawning of a new day. Go to the dawning of a new day. This is a new day. And there is nothing new under the sun. What I'm teaching, it's all in the book, people. And people say, well, be careful if it doesn't match with Scripture. Well, they don't understand every verse of Scripture has 72 different layers of interpretation. How do you think it's even possible that all these global prophets can get totally opposing words and all be right at the same time? It's because they're peering into different timetables. So, 20th century vision of the church. Basically, in the age of the church, we were functioning under the limitation of what I call 10%. What that, did you ever wonder why everybody just doesn't get saved? Why everybody just doesn't get healed? Why everybody just doesn't get filled with the Holy Ghost? It's because we were operating under a limitation, and that limitation was by divine design. I can prove, scripturally speaking, that for the last 2,000 years, We've been living in less than what the Lord planned futuristically for us to live in. When Jesus came, he told his disciples, I have so many things I want to tell you, but you cannot endure them all right now. And then when he had prepared them to go away, he said, I'm going away, but don't worry. It's expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, I cannot send the Holy Spirit. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will be the deposit on your future inheritance. Now, that's a real estate term. What that means is a 10% down payment to secure future ownership. The interesting thing for us today, and if you're sitting in this room, I guarantee you, you are definitely a part of a new 10% called the Melchizedek Order. We're stepping out of the limitation of functioning in a very, very low level. And we have been, people get mad whenever I say that, but everything in the age of the church. I want you to notice this picture. Next one, Shannon. This is where we're standing today. Actually, in the age of the church, everything we did was based on what we could see with these eyes, what we could hear with these ears. But what the Lord is doing now is he's taking us so deep, 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 calling unto deep. I want you to notice in this picture here, only 10% of what that iceberg is about is in the visible realm. 90% is in the invisible realm. <laughs> I love this because the invisible realm, so in the new move of God, what we're tapping into is coming from the invisible realm. <clears throat> so this is where we've been. Next one, Shannon. This is where we've been. Everybody says, well, I'm a fairly mature Christian. 
And I said, really? Well, I've raised the dead. I've restored amputated limbs. I've seen them grow right out of people's bodies. I've seen people's surgically removed organs restored in their body through nothing more than a sound. I would think I'm reasonably mature. But when that happened, the Lord showed me what I really was looking like. A little three-year-old girl running around trying to do. That's why it says in Hebrews, I would not brethren. You would continue to lay again the foundation of the first principles of Christ Jesus. Repentance from dead works, the baptisms, laying on of hands, healing, resurrection from the dead, oh, faith towards God, resurrection from the dead, and the doctrine of eternal judgment. Set these things aside now and come up to perfection. <laughs> we're coming up. That's called ascension. So this is what we're becoming. We're becoming transfigured, purified, resurrected, reflections of him because what you were created to be and have been in his eyesight since the day you left heaven is a light being. I love when, he st when, when I was watching Liz this morning and I said, Lord, she's about ready to explode into visible, seeable, tangible, touchable, recognizable light. That's what he sees. He doesn't see where we're standing at this present moment. He sees us as his radiant ones. And I love the fact that you say, you are the radiant ones. Whoa. When the Lord takes the veil off our eyes and we begin to see other people like that, it's amazing how fast our mental imagery is going to happen. Go to the next one, Shannon. Maybe. <laughs> okay, so uh, I want to talk to you today about going into limitlessness. Hang on just one second. Uh-oh. Come on. Let's just go. So, uh-uh. Did we lose the signal, babe? Okay, don't worry about it. Just come on down and sit down. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> Just enjoy yourself. Poor Shannon, she always gets stuck working so, so hard. And I think to myself, yeah, I got to give her. <laughs> She's actually quite a digital whiz. And uh, it's on? Okay. All right, go to the next one. Oh, no, next one, yeah. So this is where we're, what we're becoming. And when I say we're becoming instruments of light, what that means is God is beginning to wake up our internal cellular structure in our body because basically you've all been ascending since you were in the crib. And a lot of people say, well, I don't think I can ascend. I said, you've been doing it since you were born. Your body, your soul, those parts of you that are created, if you go back to the creation, it says in the beginning God formed man out of the dust of the earth. That's the creation of your body. God breathed into man and man became a living soul. That's the creation of your soul. But where is the creation of your spirit? It's not there. And the reason is your spirit is eternal. It has existed in him since before the earth was ever formed. Whoa! Which means... <laughs> If we're created in the likeness of God and we're created as a Trinitarian or a three-part being, what, how did our soul then combine with our soul, I mean our spirit, combine with our soul and our body so that we could be a three-part being, a perfect reflection of him? The way is that when your daddy's sperm hits your, mo hits your mother's egg, bang, there was a clash of light. And that clash of light is known even by the unbelieving scientists as the God particle. So basically, you were in him in the beginning. You're going to be in him at the end. What that means now is we're beginning to open up invisible doors. Whoa. Pasha. 
Whoa, ho, sorry. Not really. You know, we have this concept of heaven is like way up there. And I tell everybody, if we could just see the billions of creatures that are in this room, if he would open up our sight and we would realize how many billions, how many trillions of creatures are in... Whoa, whoa. Ha. Huh. You see, they're not way out there. Seeing is then as how we are surrounded. Oh. Okay, let's go. Hmm. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, okay. Oh. So, sorry, Wes. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. You are a weird creature. That's all I can say. <laughs> so today, I want to just talk about, number one, unlimited vision. Unlimited wisdom. Unlimited knowledge. Unlimited revelation. Unlimited anointing. Unlimited finances. Uh-oh. We're getting really carnal here. Your unlimited transportation, whoa, unlimited creativity, unlimited authority, unlimited dominion. Everybody say, dominion, 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 whoa, unlimited physical capabilities, whoa, okay, are we all okay still? I'm not about to get rid ridden out of town. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. <laughs> I just love unlimited, 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 unlimited. Woohoo! Okay, so how are we going to do that? Nobody has really walked this way before. And though we have had empirically powerful mystics in days gone by, and I'm not minimizing in one iota what they walked in. Actually, the church has forgotten more than we remember about all of that that really happened. But the things that they walked in are small things compared to what he's unleashing in us today. This is the final thrust. And what the Lord is doing at the present moment is he's begun the creation of an entirely new earth, an entirely new heaven, an entirely new humanity, and we are going to create it with him. His word says, his word says in 2 Corinthians 6, we were called to be co-workers, co-creators, together with him. Ooh, hoo, hoo. So Jesus is our pattern. Next one, Shannon. Jesus is our pattern for walking without limitations. A lot of times, it says, upon him was poured out the Spirit of God without measure. Everybody say, without measure. In him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I want everybody to put your hands on your chest right now. In me. In me. In me, in me is the fullness, is the fullness of, the of the Godhead bodily, dwelling in mortal flesh. In us, in us, in us, in us is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, dwelling in mortal flesh. All we have to do is reach down deep. And begin to pull on, out the thing that is already in us. Yeah. Everything you have need of is in you. Everything you have need of is in you. All, you, you want prosperity? It's in you. Gold is in you. I don't know how to tell you this. You can actually become gold. Uh-oh. You have the capacity inside of you to produce hidden manna. Inside of you, there is a rod and a staff of authority that can hit dominion. Whoa! That rod is budding right now. Okay, so let's talk about unlimited vision for just a second. I love un unlimited vision. 
Jesus had unlimited vision. Do you know he could see the things that were, the things that are, the things that are yet to come. So at night when you go to bed, your body and your soul, they lay down in your bed and they go to sleep. And in your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions, and your memory. But your spirit never sleeps. Your spirit is caught up instantaneously into the heavens of God and to see the things that were, the things that are, the things that are yet to come. Only when you come down, you don't remember because your memory was sound asleep. But what the Lord is doing right now is he's waking up and igniting your cellular memory. And in your cellular memory, there is water that carries frequency. There is knowledge, memory, that understanding that goes all the way back to the beginning, to the very beginning. By the way, this is not the first beginning. There have been several creations. You go all the way back to the first creation, and he can activate everything that was in the cells of your forefathers. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> the body of Christ has come to a place now. Leave behind the spiritual thing or childish things. When that which is perfect, Christ, that comes, that which is in part, our knowledge will be done away with. In other words, partial knowledge, uh oh, is going to become a thing of the past. Inside of you is wisdom, inside of you is knowledge. Inside of you is power so great. If I told you how much power there was living inside of you, you'd all fall out on the floor. Everybody will say, well, are you trying to say the Holy Spirit is only 10%? I said, absolutely not. But he can only give us as much power and as much authority as we can responsibly handle. <laughs> If Ollie came to you when he was three years old and said, Hey, Daddy, I want the keys to the car. Are you going to give him the keys to the car? I don't think so. Why? Because you know he's not yet responsible enough. All that we've been given is a type and a shadow. Whoa! We've been operating in partial knowledge, partial understanding. We know in part, we see in part, we prophesy in part. But the word says it this way. It has not yet been revealed what you shall be. The thing that's been hidden, the mystery of God that has been hidden, is about ready to be revealed. Your eye has not yet seen, your ear has not yet heard, neither has it entered into your heart the great, huge, magnificent things he has planned for us. If we stretch our imagination as far out as it'll go, I guarantee you it's still too small. The issue is, what measure of power is contained in the fullness of our inheritance? Jesus said it this way, All rule, all reign, all power, all authority was given to me in heaven and in earth, and that which my Father gave me, I now give you. But how many people do you know are operating in that measure of power and authority? That's what we're stepping into. When I tell people, if you have any idea how much power is inside of you, do you know you can literally create an entire universe? Because the one who created it all lives right inside of you. Can we take that just a little bit further? Okay, if all things were created in him, by him, for him, through him, and all things back to him, if we believe that he is omnipotent, omniscient, all-powerful, all-seeing, all-present, what that means is everything that has ever been created, listen, lives in him. And if he lives in in us. What does that mean? All things ever created live in us. Mm. That's a little mind stretching. People will say, 
People will come and they'll say, oh, this is so great. This is so big. This is so huge. This is so powerful. I said, really? Well, one day I was walking along with Enoch in the heavens, and he laid out the whole of the universe, and he said, every single level of heaven has 360 different dimensions. Every one of those 360 dimensions has inside of it 360 different realms. The realms move counterclockwise. The dimensions move clockwise. Every level of heaven has that many dimensions and that many realms. So you multiply 360 times 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 360. Times 360, times 360. Whoa. Oh. <sighs> there is so much yet for us to tap into. Whoa. Ho, ho. <laughs> The word says, when we see him face to face, when we ascend into the heavens and, and we look into those magnificent eyes, oh my goodness, <coughs> we look into those eyes, we feel his breath touch our cheek, and we listen to his words being whispered in our ear. Trust me, people, you're not going to care whether your mortgage is paid or not. I'm just saying. It isn't that he doesn't care about that. Of course he cares about it. But what I'm saying is, until he becomes the central focus of every single thing that we say, think, or do, ooh, when we behold him as in a glass, becoming his perfect reflection, Listen, the word says, we shall know him as well as he knows us. <laughs> what that means is, what, what does he know about us? Every thought we have, every word we speak, every deed we do, how many hairs are on our head, how many cells are in our body. Whoa, he's saying we can know him that much. Whoa. What does that mean? We can actually uh, Come on. think his thoughts yes. without limit. Yes. Okay. So, uh, 2 Corinthians 3 says, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, we all, everybody say, we all. We all. We all. We all. Not a few of us. Not all the, only those that are highly anointed, only those that are highly mystical. We all, whoa, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed. Everybody say changed. changed. We're changed, changed into the same image from glory to glory. <laughs> We're about ready to be changed into his image. Isn't that glorious? That's not even his human image. That is his glorified image. Whoa. Verily I say unto you. Okay. The word said. You know, this just blew my mind the first time the Lord ever spoke this to my spirit. He said, as the father loved. I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself. But what he sees the father doing. For what things soever the father does, these shall the son do likewise. For the father loves the son. And he shows him all things that he himself is doing. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickens them, even so the Son quickens whom he will. In John 12, he that sees me sees him who sent me. Now, I want to know, just a question. When people look at us, what do they see? You see, we're coming to a day. We're coming to a day, and we're stepping into it right now. It's always been available, but we're just now becoming aware of it to where we can step into the place where we can truly, without one ounce of spiritual exaltation, without one activity of spiritual pride, and say, when you see me, you see him. We're not come to be the express image of our own self. Woohoo! We're going to come to the day when we can clearly say, He that sees me 
sees him that sent me. All right, let's talk about for just a second unlimited resource. Uh, Shannon, go to the unlimited. I think we're going down to, I'm skipping to, towards the end. So go to 83. Let's talk about unlimited resource. Anybody in here ever want to have unlimited resource? Do you ever feel a little bit stifled because you can't, you just have so many things you want to do, and it's just like it takes more money than you can handle? He's causing us right now to step into unlimited resources. Amen? You know what I'm talking about, girl. <laughs> the, first time, the first time I had a dream about going to China, I'm going, I, I have this dream about going to China, and I wake up in the morning, and the Lord says, you're going to go to China. And so I, I said to my husband, honey, we're going to go to Ch I'm going to go to China. And he said, well, that's great. Do you have the money to go to China? Well, no. Do you know anybody in China? No. What is going to be your assignment in China? I don't know. Where are you going to stay when you get to China? I don't know. What's your plan? Now, he's an administrator, so he's got to have all the 10, 2, and 4. So I said... <laughs> So I said, um, honey, he says to me, as soon as you have the money to go to China, we'll see about it. So I said, well, okay. So that morning I went into my real estate company. I had a real estate firm with 28 brokers in my firm. And I pulled out my inbox, and in my inbox was an anonymous cashier's check for exactly to the penny the amount of a ticket to China. So I went home. I, to this day, I don't know where that came from, except probably some angel delivered it in the middle of the night. I went to my husband and I said, honey, honey, you said whenever the money came in, we could talk about me going to China. So I bought this ticket. I went to China. This is at a time when we don't even have enough money to feed our children, literally. I could give hundreds of testimonies about how God manifested and materialized things during that time. So I buy a ticket to China, and I fly into China, and this is before the Olympics. So the Chinese airport was an outrageous place, and I had never, ever been to a persecuted nation. This is my first trip, going into a persecuted nation. So I get off of the, I get off of the plane, and I'm coming down, and they have homeless people stacked up on rice mats, five on top of one another, and the people are shoulder to shoulder, front to back. I'm telling you, if one person in that room fell over, the whole room was going to fall over. We were like sardines all clamped inside of there. And these porters would come up and hit one another and punch one another trying to take my bags because, of course, I looked like a rich American, even though I didn't even have a dollar in my pocket. And I'm standing there thinking to myself for four hours. I stood there thinking, oh, I'm such a stupid woman. I should have listened to my husband. I should have made arrangements. I should have contacted people. I should have gotten a hotel room. I should have waited until I had the money to do all of this stuff. And pretty soon I start crying. And I go and I sink down in a little corner and try and hide from everybody. I'm just sitting there rocking back and forth, praying in tongues. All of a sudden, this man walks up to me and he puts his hand on my shoulder. And he whispers. Now, nobody there spoke English. This is before, before. Okay, everybody, everything was in Mandarin. There wasn't an English sign anywhere. So this man puts his hand on my shoulder, and he leans over, and he says, he says, excuse me, you wouldn't be from the United States, would you? And I said, well, yes, I would. I was just so excited. Somebody spoke English. <laughs> and he says, um, you wouldn't be a minister of the gospel, would you? And I went, yes, yes, I am. He says, your name wouldn't be... Nancy Cohen, would it? <laughs> and I said, how did you know? He goes, well, the Holy Spirit told us you were coming. We've been waiting for four days. What took you so long? <laughs> so he thrust me right into the underground home cell church system, and every need was met. Whoa. I can tell you hundreds of stories about how the Lord actually can manifest and materialize things even in the earthly realm, when our whole focus is set unto him. At this particular time, my husband and I had lost millions of dollars in a big business transaction, and, and we were really, really at the end of our rope. Our house was going up for sale at, at the tax office. 
And, and everything was being taken away except I was rejoicing because the Lord told me that in that my husband would end up giving his life to the Lord. So when he came home and he told me, I don't know how to tell you this. We're going to have to file bankruptcy. And I just took his little face and I said, well, honey, it's okay. Well, actually, what I said was, praise the Lord. <laughs> and he said, what? And I said, oh, I, I, I'm so sorry. So sorry, okay? During the course of that time, he was one to the Lord. And for the next six months, the Lord did supernatural miracles of provision every single day. For six months, it was just the most amazing time of my whole life. I, I, we would be sitting there. I'd come home from work. My little daughter would crawl under the table. She'd say, Mommy, I'm, I'm, I'm hungry. What are we going to eat? Well, honey, I don't know, but God knows. We didn't even have a stick of bread, anything in the house. And I said, let's just crawl under the table and we'll just praise the Lord and see what he does. Sure enough, after a few minutes, we get a call from HEB or a big grocery store in America. Uh, Ma'am, you've just won a $200 gift certificate. Would you like to come and pick up your groceries? Now, I don't have a single thing to feed my kids in the cabinet. So we go. I'm so, I, got, I got all kinds of meat, potatoes, enough to last for probably a month and a half. That tells you how long ago that was. <laughs> $200 is enough food for a month and a half. So I go and I make the dinner for the kids. I lay the kids down. I say their prayers. And I come back out to put the groceries away. And the Lord said, tomorrow you take every bit of that and give it away to the poor. And I said, could I just have a, a couple potatoes? Could I, could I just keep a loaf of bread? No, give it all. Give it all. Give it all away. Okay? So the next day, the girls come home from school. We jump up and we go out. And we start passing out all of the provisions. On my way home, the Lord says, uh, I hear this little voice jumps up and says, you stupid woman, you gave all that food away. And now what are your own children going to eat? So we get home again. Nothing in the cupboards. <laughs> Robin says to me, Mommy, I'm hungry. What are we going to eat? Well, honey, I don't know, but God knows. So we crawl underneath the table. We start praising and worshiping the Lord. Pretty soon, the doorbell rings, and a lady comes to the door who's one of our neighbors who don't have any idea that we've just lost everything we, we have. She comes with a 50-gallon bag of food, and she's crying. And she said, Nancy... My freezer went out today, and all of this food is going to go bad. Do you think you could take some of this food off of my hands? And I said, I don't know. Let me pray about it. <laughs> so we go and we fix the dinner. We come out. <laughs> I, I put my kids to bed, and I come back out and start to put the food away. And the Lord said, take it <clears throat> tomorrow and give every bit of it away. And so the next day we went and we gave it all away. There were people whose lives were really saved during that time because of the food that we gave away. This went on every day for six months, amazing miracles of provision. I was a realtor at that time, and I drove about 280 miles a day every day, and for six months, I didn't put a single drop of gas in my car. And people would get in my car, and they'd go, oh, we better go to the gas station. You don't have any gas. I said, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> The day my husband brought home his first paycheck after being without a job for a whole year, I was doing a women's aglow thing, and it was 2 o'clock in the morning before I got done. Remember, I hadn't had any gas in my car for uh, six months. So I pull out, and I run out of gas. And I'm not kidding, two angels showed up, pushed my car 10 miles through two subdivisions uphill, and stopped right in front of the only gas pump in the whole city that was still open at 2 o'clock in the morning. God just did things like that. The, the, the thing of it is, is after six months, we're sitting under the table one day. And I'm waiting. Robin's saying, Mommy, Mommy, I'm so hungry. I, I, what are we going to eat? I said, well, honey, I don't know, but God knows. So we crawl under the table. We're worshiping, worshiping, worshiping for like three hours. No telephone rings, no doorbell rings. And I think, well, you know, maybe tonight we're just going to go to bed hungry. So after a while, we crawl out from underneath our dining room table, and the whole table 
was full of a massive amount of food. And on there were gold, gold lavers and crystal plates and beautiful crystal goblets. And it was the most magnificent feast we had ever had. I took my kids and put them down for breakfast or for, for uh, bed. And when I came out, all the dishes were gone. And all the dishes were done and all the food was put away. You see, God is doing things in a way today that will blow our minds if we just believe in his supernatural, unlimited resources. In him there is no limitation. People come today and they say, well, we need healing or, or we, need, we need a prophetic word or we need this or we need that. And I say, okay, come with me and we'll just go to heaven. When you have him lay hands on you and prophesy the word, you don't need me. You don't need me. So let me just take you to the one who can do it all. Let's go to the next one, Shan. Yeah, so let's talk about unlimited transportation. How many of you here flew here? If you flew here, raise your hand, okay? Did you get to sit in economy or did you get to sit in business class or? Yeah. I want to just ask you another question. How many of you, since you've been little children, have been dreaming that you can fly? Okay, everybody put your hand up. The truth of the matter is you can fly. Your spirit has been flying since you were in your crib. Your spirit can show up any place in the earth while your body and your soul are sound asleep in your bed. Your spirit is doing stuff every single night. And how this happens is, let me just show you. you you'll, you'll get it in just one second. How many of you have, say you're working through your, you're working through your normal business day, and all of a sudden you get into a deep conversation with someone. And the hair on the back of your neck stands straight up. And everything inside of you is screaming, I have been in this conversation before. And you know, he's going to say this, she's going to say that. The dog's going to bark. The doorbell's going to ring. The baby's going to cry. And you're playing it all out on behind your eyes. And it happens exactly the way you know it's going to happen. Okay. How many of you in here will confess? <laughs> What really happened there, because we don't understand it, when that takes place, the soul in our body sits up and says, you stupid person, you couldn't have had this conversation before. You just met these people today. And you take that experience and you put it on a back shelf and you call it deja vu because you don't understand what just happened. What really happened was one night your body, your soul, your spirit your body and your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, and your memory went to sleep. Your spirit was caught up in the heavens to see the things that were, the things that are, and the things that are yet to come. But on that particular day, the thing your spirit saw that was yet to come was downloaded into earth's present, and your spirit picked up on it. You've all been doing this since you were very small children. The issue is you don't really remember. But what the Lord is doing now is he's beginning to bring us into the remembrance of some of the... You've been doing huge exploits. You just don't remember the exploits you've been doing because this memory went sound asleep in your bed. What the Lord is doing now is he's beginning to release us into what I call unlimited transportation. What that means is you can be in a multitude of different locations. At the not, even, uh, you can even be wide awake. Stand here and just completely disappear into another nation. Jesus did those things. So everything that he did, we can do also. People say, well, what do you talk about when you're saying you're transdimensionalizing? That's new age. And I go, right, because it is a new age. The issue, the issue is when you, when, you <laughs> when you have the call of the Spirit to move from one place to another, Jesus did it. That's why he was in a city. They're ready to stone him. And as they pick up the stones, he disappears in this dimension 
moves into another dimension, walks straight through the presence of the people, and nobody knew where he was. We can do that. I do that on a regular basis. And I'm not saying that because I want you to think I'm some highly anointed prophet of God. Actually, everyone in here can do the very same thing. And you have been doing it. You're just not aware of what you're doing. I, uh, <laughs> I got a call one time from an underground home cell church pastor in China. And she uh, actually emailed me and said, thank you so much for coming to our church. Our whole church has been shifted and changed. All of our mindsets are completely destroyed. We're rebuilding our neural pathways and doing all of that kind of stuff. Well, I've been to China many times, and I've been to probably somewhere over 100 cities in China, but I've never been to that province before. So I wrote to the girl, and I said, you may have gotten mixed up with another girl who, whose name is also Nancy that ministers in that province. But even though I've been to China many times, I've never been to your province before. She sends me back a picture of me preaching in her pulpit in a province where I have never been before. Now, I'm looking at that, and I like to always test everything by the word. So I say, Lord, this is looking a little new agey to me. Could you just show me where this is in Scripture? So he says, sure, come on up here. So away I go to the time after Jesus' ascension, when, he, when the disciples are all meeting by the sea, and then they're in a little cabin. All the windows and the doors are closed and locked because they're afraid still that they're going to be next. And Jesus shows up, and he spreads out his arms, and he walks straight through the walls, which meant he was there in spirit. But then he put out his hands. Put your finger in the nail hole of my hands. Put your hand in the wound in my side, which meant he was there in body too. So if Jesus did it, woohoo, we can do it, right? I had a very good friend one time who was leading a an ascension thing, and he, when we ascended, he said, I want everybody in here right now to unify with the persecuted church. Well, I've been, I've spent 20 years in the persecuted church, so the second he said that, bang, I was in Iran, and I was actually hovering over a very small group of Christians who were meeting there under threat of their life. They're meeting in this place, and I showed up, and I'm hovering over the top of them, and the Lord opened their eyes, and they actually saw me hovering up there. So on the front, we have all of these leaders, and these leaders are pointing up, and they're talking. The Lord sent me there with a message, which I telecommunicated to them, because Jesus understood telepathy. That's how he could read what was in their mind before they ever even said a word. Why are you thinking in your mind these things? Why are you saying in your heart these things? They hadn't spoken he read the frequency of their mind and the frequency of their heart. Those things are, if he did it, we can do it, okay? So I'm standing there, and, I, and, and the telepathic message to the persecuted church was this. God sent me here to tell you something is about ready to happen, but don't worry and don't be afraid and don't run. It's a divine setup. So these elders are looking up and they're pointing and they're whispering back and forth to one another. A few minutes later, the doors broke in and some jihad terrorists came in armed with M16s. And they went up to the very front and they pointed their, their rifles out to the people and said, you have exactly five minutes to vacate this pre premises. And many of them did get up and leave. They had small children, okay? So... So they're, they're moving out of the building. About five minutes later, they chained up the door, locked it with a combination lock, went up to the stage, sat on the stage, put down their rifles, and turned to the remaining people and said, now we want you to tell us about your, your God. Because they understood the remaining people were ready to die for their testimony of Christ Jesus. You see, we have the capacity to do that. I've actually been all over the universe, sometimes with him. We've done some mysterious things. 
in the invisible realms. It's true. It's true. <laughs> I met somebody recently that was involved in a group of people that I became entangled with. And when I first met him, the day I met him, I said, who are you? And he looked at me. I scared him because I was a little intense. And he said, did I do something wrong? And I said, no, who are you? <laughs> and he goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, I've known you since before the foundation of the world. And the issue is, when you have a common, a common goal inscribed on your scroll, the chances are you have known them since before the foundation of the earth. Because in the realms of time and space and distance, when you're released from that, whoa, okay, I'm going to have to go on. <laughs> Unlimited transportation. So can I just say how this is migrating into even more than that? Only a few weeks ago, I had five people from five different continents who all called me on the very same day. One guy said, I was dying of cancer. I was in the hospital. They had turned me over to hospice already. And one night at 3 o'clock in the morning, you're moving across my bed in a circular motion, making some really weird sounds. <laughs> and the next day, I was healed. The next person called up. And this happened all on one day, five of them, all from five different continents. And they would say, um, you showed up in our room at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I'm thinking, OK. Three o'clock in the morning, my time, is noon their time. So why are they saying I called them at three o'clock in the morning when three o'clock in the morning, my time, is noon their time, or seven in the evening, their time, or two o'clock in the afternoon, their time, but they all said at three o'clock in the morning. So now I'm thinking what the Lord is calling us to now is above and beyond time. The time constraints and the time relativity. Whoa! Are you guys all okay? Yes. Okay, all right. I'm just, just checking, just checking. So let's say unlimited energy. Uh, we've got, we're done at 4.30. Are we done at 4.30? Okay. Unlimited energy. Uh, this I love because people ask me all the time, how do you have unlimited energy? Because I do have when I'm doing the work of the Lord. Now, when I'm in normal state, I can be just as much made of clay as anybody. And, 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 but when I am focused on what the Lord has me to do, time makes absolutely no difference. I was in India, in, in India one time, and I went to this school that was built by an American and a British philanthropist. And it was a school that was built 100% for orphans. So they had 10,000 orphans in this home called the City of, of Life, in the City of Love. So there are two of them. Anyway, while I was there, the head administrator had to go to do something with the government, and he left me there for 10 days by myself. And he said, do you, you think you'll be okay to just stay here for 10 days? I said, sure, fine. Go and do whatever you have to do. At the end, <laughs> after he had already flown away, the Lord said, I want you to lay hands and prophesy over all 10,000 of these orphans. And I said, okay, Lord. You know, I'm not, I'm not a short prophesier, right? <laughs> I mean, I just don't grab somebody and say, God's going to bless you. He's going to give you a nice bit. I go all the way back in their generations. I said, do you have any idea how long it's going to take to prophesy over 10,000 orphans? And he just laughed. He always laughs at me like I'm a little three-year-old girl trying to figure things out. He goes, do you think I would ask you to do something and then not provide the energy for you to be able to do it? And I said, well, no, Lord. So I started 24 hours a day for 10 days. I never had a drink of water. I never sat down. I never went to bed. And I never even went to the bathroom. Ten days just laying hands on all these beautiful little children from Indian's most poverty-stricken cities. Of course, after all of that lifted, I thought to myself, oh, God, show me a bed. i got, I got to get to a bed. So I walk out of this room, and I'm walking across the, the city plaza where they have this huge, uh, huge flag, Christian flag, 
<laughs> and all of a sudden, this World War II siren goes off. And it's going, this is 3 o'clock in the morning. At 3 o'clock in the morning, 10,000 Indian orphans got out of bed, came down, put me in the middle of the city, raised their hands to me, and prayed for almost three hours in tongues. I'm telling you what, my energy came back really quick. <laughs> and, I, and I began to cry, and I said, Oh, God, if any prayer would hit your heart, 10,000 orphans. Yeah. The first time I ever told that story, there was a doctor in the crowd, and he comes up to me, and he goes, Lady, you're just a liar. You're just making all that up. It's humanly impossible for any human being to go 10 days without water and 10 days without going to the bathroom, you would be dead. It's humanly impossible. I said, exactly, because it's not human. It's spirit. You see, when we take back our primordial position and we put our soul in our body under governance to our eternal person... There is no limitation. In China, I went to the underground home cell church of China. And there, this is, uh, this is probably 20, 25 years ago, before I knew all of this. They took me into this cave church. And a thousand believers actually walked, some of them 50 miles, little old ladies in the snow, in their bare feet, coming to hear what I was bringing to them in a... In a in a cave of all places. Wow. During the course of that time, there were about a thousand of them. And they didn't come because everybody called them on the phone or because they sent out a notice on the computer. They would wake up in the morning and go, Lord, where is our meeting going to be today? And he'd say, well, walk about 25, 25 miles down this road. Look up to the right, and there'll be a big stand of trees there. And behind that big stand of trees... There'll be a cave, and the meeting is going to be in that cave. They all came, totally by invitation of the Holy Spirit. So we get into this cave, and um, I'm saying, okay, Lord, what message? He goes, well, I want you to pray. And I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I know how to pray. I've been praying 18 hours a day most of my life, which, by the way, today I can do more in four words in a whisper than I could with 18 hours of prayer before. But the issue is, I would say uh, to my translator, have all of those who've been in prison for the sake of the gospel move over to the right. Well, they'd all get up and move over to the right. <laughs> and I said, no, you're, you're not translating something right. I just want only those that have been in prison and tortured for the sake of the gospel, tell, tell them to move over to the left. Well, they all got up and moved over to the left. So I said to my translator, um, you're not translating something right. And he touched me on the shoulder and he said, Nancy, they've all been imprisoned for the sake of the gospel. I looked up there and I said, okay, let's just pray. <laughs> I lifted up my hands and started to pray. Eight and a half hours, we're still praying. And nobody said a single word. And I said, and you're sending me over here to teach them how to pray? Don't think so. You see, you have limitless amounts of energy. Whoosh! Whoosh! <laughs> Limit, limitless amounts of energy. When we take back our primordial position and we actually step into the full, limitless functionality of the spirit realm, there will be nothing impossible to us you know the issue is everybody's looking for the signs and the wonders and the miracles and I don't want to minimize those but it's really less than what he's really looking for he even told his own disciples if you cannot believe me for my name's sake would you please at least believe me for the signs and miracles Signs and miracles are secondary. They're just the downflow of what comes from the heaven when you're really, really, really 
determined to give him everything you have. Body, soul, and spirit. The issue is we're now coming into this day when these things I'm talking over with you are going to begin to manifest in you. There were days, even in my ministry, when I would be in the middle of preaching and all of a sudden gold would come oozing out of all of my pores. And it would look like I was literally sprayed with mylar. I had this guy one time. He took out a full-page ad. And he said, this lady's a charlatan. She's shredding gold mylar and blowing it out all of the air conditioning units and all of that kind of stuff. Well, he was a jeweler. So I called him on the phone and I said, if you think that, come and test it for yourself. The next day, he took out a full page at it <laughs> because it was not only ugh, everything we have need of is already inside of us. Gold, jewels, diamonds, rubies, emeralds would just fall out of the ceiling, and they were real gems. I said, Lord, if you did that back then, why can't you do that now? And he goes, I was just giving you a foretaste of things that are yet to come. Those things are going to become normal. And I'm here to tell you that in China, I'll finish with this story, Hmm, maybe, (laughs) I went to China many, many times, but one time I found out about this man called the living martyr of China, and he had been in a Chinese dungeon for 28 years, and he had had all but three of the bones in his body broken. So when I found out about him, I sent him a letter. I said, I'm coming to bring you Bibles. I'm coming to bring you discipleship material. (laughs) And I couldn't wait to get there. It was like my divine appointment. But the day before we were supposed to land in his city to take all of this stuff, we got arrested. And they found out that we were bringing Bibles into China. And so they took away our passports and they assigned us armed guards to go with us everywhere that we were in China because we had people from eight different nations and they didn't want to start an international incident. So rather than putting us in prison, which would have incurred the wrath of eight different governments, they just followed us around with armed guards. So we felt like we couldn't accomplish anything. We went from one city to the other city, couldn't preach the gospel, couldn't pass out Bibles, couldn't do anything that we thought that we were there to do, okay? But when we got to Shanghai, the Lord said, I want you to go into the middle of the projects in Shanghai. Now, in Shanghai, in these projects, there are murders every single day. There are murders, there's drug addiction, there's all kinds of prostitution, all kinds of sexual perversion there, and the police will not even go into that place. So the good thing was... We went and did what the Lord said, and we went to the projects, and we lost our guard. And when we came out, we were free. Well, the next day was the day that we were supposed to leave to go back to the States, and we couldn't get on our plane because they had all of our passports. So if we don't show up, we're going to be stuck in China forever because they have all of our passports. So I thought to myself, I wonder if I could go and see the living martyr of China. Now, before we left, I had taken three of these book bags, which had 70 pounds of Bibles in them. They, we carried them about 25 miles a day. From the back of our neck to the bottom of our knees, they're full of books. Well, when we got arrested on the train, we, had, we threw out three of these book bags. And later on, in the middle of the night, I went and gathered them up. And I said, Lord, what to do with these book bags? And he said, take them to this hotel that's down the road and put them in the luggage room. So I took them down, I put them in the luggage room, and meanwhile, we're going all over China. On this particular day, we were leaving China from the city where the living martyr lived. And I thought, Lord, I wonder if those books could still be there. So sure enough, I went back to the hotel. They were still in the luggage room. And I picked him up, and I hired, <laughs> I hired a rickshaw driver, which was really hard because he doesn't know any English, and I don't know any Chinese. So all I have is this little rice paper. And I hand him the address, and it takes him about two and a half hours of driving all over this city to find it, and finally we came to it. When we got there, I didn't know this, but the bottom floor, everything in China is built upwards because land is such a high value. 
So the houses could be quite large, but they're quite skinny. So they're all built up. And on the bottom floor, they had, um, they had a police station. But I didn't know they had a police station down there. And fortunately for me, the police were all gone to lunch. So I go to the front door, and on the door, printed in, I forget if it was six, it, six or eight different foreign languages, were the words, it is against the law of the People's Republic of China for anyone to enter this, this house for the purposes of worshiping Jesus Christ. Now, I have all of these books here. This man's quite famous, okay? So I have all of these books here, and I'm just determined this is my divine appointment. This is the whole reason I came to China. So I open up the door, and I have these book bags are like this, and the hallway's like this. So I have to jerk these bags up, and I'm banging on the walls and trying to get all these bags up to the first floor. When I got up to the first floor, nobody was there. So I sat down, and I thought, Lord, I know this is my whole purpose in being here is for this meeting. So you're just going to have to bring somebody because I don't want to leave all these Bibles here and nobody take them because if the police find them, they could be in really bad trouble. So I'm sitting there praying and praying. Pretty soon I start crying. Nobody comes to pick up the Bibles. So I thought, well, today is the day we have to leave China. So I got up to leave, and all of a sudden I noticed over in the corner there was this ladder that was made out of two tree stumps, and it had five or six tree limbs lashed on with binders twine going up into a little loft over that area. And I thought, well, maybe somebody's up there. So I left the book bags downstairs. I crawl up the ladder and get into the loft, and when I got there, I fell over on my face. I have never, ever, ever, anywhere been on such holy ground. And I just fell over, and I started crying. This is just this is where the persecuted church be, blah, blah, blah. And I'm blubbering like a baby. They have these benches made out of tree stumps with two by eight spread across and nailed about three or four rows of them. There's no musical instruments. There's no wall hangings on the wall. There's no pulpit. There's no nothing. But I just felt the holiness of God in that room. So I'm sitting there weeping, sobbing, Lord, please bring someone to pick up these Bibles. And as I'm praying there, I'm thinking, I'm going to have to leave because I'm going to get left and my plane's going to leave. And I got up to leave and I heard a broomstick hit the floor. And I turned around, and there at the end of the room was this woman standing behind a false wall. She was about this high. She had had her eyes cut out of her head for declaring in a public arena that she had had a vision of Jesus Christ. She had her ears sliced off the side of her head. She's just listening out these little holes because she declared in, in the public market that everyone could hear from Jesus they had mangled up her mouth. I don't know why they didn't cut out her tongue. But anyway, she's peering out, and apparently I had gotten very, very quiet. So she's looking out, and I see her. She's just itty-bitty, teeny, tiny little thing. And I said, hello, hello. She goes, oh, American, American. And she starts jumping up and down and turning around, and all the windows in this place fly open, and all of these multitudes of children crawl in from the windows because the night before their parents had all been arrested and taken to jail. And when they heard me coming up those stairs with those book bags, they thought I was the police coming after them. So all of these little children are scattered out on hot tin roofs sitting there and waiting for me to leave. So when I, when I got there, they came in and they started singing and dancing all around me and just rejoicing. And this woman, whose name was Joy, <laughs> imagine that, she comes and she takes my hand and she says, come, come. And she pulls me behind this invisible, it's like a, a fake wall. And back behind there was a, a little pathway about this big. And at the end of the pathway... There was a little bookshelf about this tall, and on the bookshelf were 89 copies of the New Testament, 100% handwritten by those children. And she takes her shoulder, and she shoves open the door, uh, shoves this little bookcase, and back behind it, there's a little brass 
hand-pounded door hung on the wall with two giant paper clips. She opens up the door, and she motions me to come in. And there, as I bent over, was the living martyr of China. And he was laying in a room that was about five and a half feet long and about three feet tall on a rice mat, face down, where he had been for ten days, praying that God would help me get through with those Bibles. When he crawled out, I was asking him some questions, and in all of my American arrogance, we sit down to the table, and, he's, and I asked him, I said, what is, it, what is it like to live in a nation where you're so brutalized for the cause of Christ? And he just laughed, and he said, I don't mind it one bit. And he said, in fact, I am a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief, stricken, smitten, afflicted, rejected, who's learned obedience by the things that I've suffered. With that, I said, as a member of the American church, what could I possibly do for the church in China? And he just threw his head back and gut laughed. And he said, I would prefer to tell you what I wish you would not do. And I said, well, what is that? Number one, don't send money. And number two, don't pray for an end to the persecution. Now, I looked at him, and I mean, my chin about fell down to here because I was from the name it, claim it, blab it, grab it faith movement, okay? And so, so I looked at him in total disbelief. And I said, he could tell I didn't have any understanding about what he was saying. So I said, just let me explain myself to you. He said, in China... Uh, when people come here from America, and actually there have been quite famous people who've been to his place, they look at the estate of the Chinese church and they go back and they send $50,000 to a little home cell pastor who's been home pastoring for four years without ever even seeing a copy of the written word. And when, that, that home cell pastor has never made more than $200 a year in his whole life. And what happens is immediately they'll backslide. And he said it causes competition amongst all the other churches. So he said, please don't send money. Then I said, persecution. Why should I not pray for the end of the persecution? And he laughed and he said, in our nation, there is no such thing as nominal Christianity. Nobody joins a church because their grandparents started a church. And nobody goes to church so they can do business. And nobody goes to church so that they can have relationships. When they come to the church in China, they've already counted the cost. They've already paid the price. They've already died the death. As a result of that, our little 8-year-old children go out and raise the dead every day. And they don't even think of it as being a miracle because the word says that's what we're supposed to do. You see, in the, it, it, our, our understanding of what God is doing currently in the earth is uh, very minimized compared to what he is doing. Now, I want to end on a positive note. <laughs> Everybody okay with that? Where we're going and I love seeing the little children running around here. Those little children are literally going to do things that we have never even conceived of doing. All of those that have been born since the year 2000 or since born again since the year 2000 have been born out of Zion. And they come to this earth with things indelibly etched into their spirit that the previous generations, though they had it, never understood it. The children uh, that are your children and your grandchildren are going to begin to have angelic visitations with recognizable fruit flowing out of that from the time that they're born. They're going to hear sounds. They're going to hear frequencies. They're going to operate in levels of heavenly participation that we think of being unusual, but to them it's going to become an everyday thing. The thing that is inside of you is now being revealed. And how that is being revealed, 
Oh, it's so much bigger, so much higher than, so much greater than, so much broader than, so much more powerful than anything that we have yet anticipated. The things that you're going to do are going to so far outshine everything that has been done in the last 2,000 years because we are the ones that are called to lay down the foundations of an entirely new heaven, an entirely new earth, and an entirely new people. You are the predecessors. You are the ones that are going to invoke. God's going to go deep, deep into the center of your being, and he's going to break up all the fountains of the deep. He's going to bring all that glory that's inside of you and has always been inside of you. He's going to bring it to the top, and you're going to be, begin to function in signs and wonders and miracles. You're going to function by telepathy. You're going to function by cardiognosis. You're going to transdimensionalize. You're going to transmutate. You're going to grow younger and younger and younger. You're going to burst into living light. And there is coming a day soon when you're not going to have to preach the gospel at all. You will walk into the grocery stores. You will go to the gas pump. And people will literally fall down on their face crying out, show us how to be saved. Show us. Whoa. What must we do? Because they're going to see, they're going to see in us the thing that all creation has been groaning for. The thing that all creation has been groaning for. Nature is going to respond to you. The fish of the sea are going to respond to you. The birds of the air are going to respond to you. When they see the one thing that they've been looking and longing for since the beginning, the restoration of our dominion in him. They are going to respond, and it's beginning already. So get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Stand up. Father, we just thank you and we praise you that these are people that are in readiness, that we're looking for, longing for, waiting to be the answer to all creation groaning. We thank you that as all creation begins to respond to the call that is in us, whoa. Let's do it again. Whoa. One more time. Whoa. <laughs> so go forth with joy. Be led forth with peace. And we'll see you for an awesome message tonight. Amen. Everybody have a great lunch.